Okay, well, we might get started because we've got quite a bit of content to get through today. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today for our webinar on the benefits of rooftop solar for community housing providers. My name is Sarah Walker, and I work in the sector capacity team here at QCOS. I just wanted to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're facilitating this webinar today, the Turrbal and Yuggera peoples, and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past and present. QCOS thanks the First Nations peoples for the gift of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, and we look forward to supporting work leading to a successful referendum to enshrine a First Nations voice to Parliament in the Australian Constitution, followed by Makarata and Treaty. QCOS welcomes the invitation to walk with First Nations peoples in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. So I'd like to encourage you to um, take a moment to use the chat function to let us know which traditional lands you're dialing in from today. Um, online today, we've got people from various parts of the country. So it's a really lovely way to acknowledge the breadth of country and connection to land of our First Nations people. So in terms of the content today, we've got um, a really exciting lineup of guest speakers. Um, in terms of this topic, um, it's a really important time to be considering renewable energy. As we know, energy costs are on the rise and the rising cost of living is impacting many people and especially those who may be living in community or social housing or experiencing vulnerability. So it's a great time for both community organisations and community housing providers to explore renewable energy. Um, it's also a good time to start looking into this because as many of you may be aware, the Queensland government recently released the Energy and Jobs Plan. So this was released by the Department of Energy and Public Works. And this plan does outline a focus on empowering households and businesses by delivering affordable energy and supporting more rooftop solar and batteries. So today we'll be hearing from three guest speakers. So first up, we'll have Will Anstey, who is a business development consultant from Alum Energy. Will is going to speak about the new SolShare technology, which is the world's only hardware for sharing rooftop solar to apartments. So he'll speak about how the SolShare works, the types of dwellings it can be installed on, and he will also present two case studies of community housing providers that used Illum SolShare technology. Our second guest speaker is Jane West, who is the CEO of Brick Housing. Brick Housing were recently successful in receiving funding support from the Queensland Government's Community Sustainability Action Grant Program to install shared rooftop solar on a multi-dwelling community housing complex in Redcliffe. Brick Housing are partnering with Alum Energy on this project, and this new build will be the first community housing unit block in Queensland to have rooftop solar where solar energy is shared between tenants in a unit block. And our final guest speaker is Ryan Rosenbaum, who is the head of assets at City West Housing, which is a leading community housing provider in New South Wales. City West Housing is committed to reducing its carbon footprint to reduce the impact on climate change. And one of the ways they decided to work towards this was by connecting rooftop solar to several apartment complexes in their portfolio using Illum's Soul Share technology. So Ryan will speak about City West Housing's journey with installing rooftop solar, including their decision-making process, motivations, and the outcomes and impacts on their tenants as well. Um, and I'd really encourage you to utilize the chat function today. Um, let us know if rooftop solar is something your organization has thought about. And if you're a community housing provider, whether this is something you're exploring for the properties you manage. Um, you're, you're welcome to share your thoughts using the chat function throughout the webinar um, because it's really great to hear where people are at in the process. Um, and of course, after each guest speaker presents, there will be time um, for anyone to ask questions as well. So I would just like to welcome Will Anstey um, from Illum Energy as our first guest speaker. Thanks, Will. Thanks for the kind uh, introduction, Sarah. Um, so I'll quickly share my screen, everyone. Uh, pleasure to have everyone here. Um, uh, I'm personally based in Melbourne, but joining from Canberra today. Um, so it's been quite an exciting day, to say the least. All right, let's go from here. All right. 
So benefits of rooftop solar for community housing providers. Uh, so Illume Energy um, has been in the space now um, since about 2015. Um, and our apartment focus has kind of been, been in the realm of apartments since 2017 and now SolShare Tech's been around since 2019. Um, so quite a few years in the market now, um, which has been um, really rewarding in that sense. How we came about though was um, our approach to the solar sphere and community housing was the ability to democratise solar. And through a fair bit of research, we came across um, some key significant points um, of concern or stresses within that market. So as a CHP, a lot of CHPs um, could obtain solar for their independent residencies. Um, as soon as it came to a multi-res site, it became a little bit more difficult. You had to either get an individual system um, for each apartment, and you've got your common area as well, or you might go down the path of embedded networks for your larger, larger sized um, sorts of things. As mentioned, common area light and power was generally the way to go, um, which was a good thing because it provided a financial saving to the CHP, um, you know, um, allowed you to take on renewables. Um, another thing was that on-site usage of solar generated um, a lot of the time is quite uh, a high percentage is exported. So they wanted better use of any of that solar generated on site, especially as feed-in tariffs reduce um, in the future as well. Uh, the solution needed to be cost effective and usable for new and their existing housing assets. So it wasn't good to just have something that would be good for new builds. We needed to some way to retrofit those um, existing building assets within um, CHP portfolios. And they also um, found that residents themselves communicated that they wanted ownership of their electricity accounts. So this became a key thing. Uh, people wanted that flexibility to choose whether, you know, shop around for your energy retailer to get the best deal, feed in tariff, et cetera. Um, just the same way that a person in an individual home um, would have that ability as well. And the key thing as well, they wanted to future proof their apartments, oh, well, their assets. So that whether that was um, to allow EV charging in, in future or battery um, take on in the future when it made financial sense as well. And Collated, that, that's where we came through and uh, created the Soul Share, uh, which is this beautiful white um, hardware box here. We've got a camera and our CEO um, there in the um, black top there and Christy, our CTO. Um, so we won quite a few awards, Clean Energy Council, you know, bits and pieces. Um, but the key thing that we've got is we've got over 1,200 apartments um, connected within Australia uh, to sole share uh, systems. We're also established in the US and UK, a little bit earlier on there. Um, but our main market is Australia um, in both social housing and standard residential and small commercial even. Um, I'm personally based down in Melbourne, which is where our head office is. Um, and we also manufacture uh, down in Melbourne, um, down there as well, which is a nicety uh, to have. So, uh, big thing is, how does that work? How does Soul Share work? How does it, how are you allowed to have one shared system that can connect multiple apartments? So, traditionally, you couldn't connect more than one electricity meter. So, you obviously have one electricity meter per residency or residency um, on site or the unit. Um, there was no way to connect multiple meters to one system. Um, however, the Soul Share has unlocked that ability and that's where we're very unique in the market and in the world as the only um, technology or hardware that allows you to do that. So you take uh, a, a larger uh, commercial size system, um, as you can see here, um, you've got your panels on the roof, we've got three panels there, you've got a couple more in, in reality. Um, and then that, what that does is that'll feed one cable down to uh, wherever the inverter sits. Now the inverter might, might be on the basement or the common car park. So you'll have an inverter that converts the solar power to usable power, AC power within the building. This then feeds into the magic SolShare box. So a SolShare module or a SolShare box in that sense will sit as close as possible, ideally to the um, electricity meter board on, on site. So wherever the, uh, the shared meter board with all the electricity meters are, um, just adjacent to that. So that when, you know, whoever's coming to read the meters needs to come and read them, they'll be on, usually in a room on the basement um, on the main switchboard um, on the ground floor. Sometimes these boards are per floor, depending on the tenancy. 
Um, but either or, the Soul Share allows you to connect at the switchboard behind each meter. Um, so that integration method is no different to how it is in a standalone home. Um, so it makes it very straightforward, very simple. However, you only need one inverter for every 10 to 15 um, apartments. Uh, so it's a lot cheaper for maintenance um, and longevity of the product as well. Um, what I guess the, the biggest fundamental um, thing that makes SolShare different is that ability to connect more than one grid meter. Um, but then we also have our underlying software that amplifies that benefit. So it'd be all well and good just to share the energy equally between everyone at any one time. But what the SolShare actually does, it has a smart algorithm that's built in. So that smart algorithm monitors uh, the energy usage or electricity usage of each apartment that it's connected to. So if you had say 15 apartments, as we've got in this complex, because we've got 15 meters, it'll measure each individual's um, energy usage at any one time, and then feed solar to those who need it when they need it. Now there's a few different ways we can set up. So um, sometimes it's just on a um, extra, like simple energy usage basis. So whoever's using energy will get that energy if they have a need for it. With that scenario, we see it a lot in social housing where the housing provider um, owns the asset, they own the solar. Um, whereas sometimes in, in other social housing assets, what we'll do is an equal allocation. So we work on a month to month period. At the end of the month, each tenant will obtain the same amount of solar as the neighbor or every other neighbor within the tenancy. If you have different size bedroom homes, so you might have a two bedroom apartment, single bedroom apartment, you can also go um, an uneven share and ratio it based on that. So the, the impact on a percentage basis is very, very similar uh, there as well. Uh, so from there, I'll sneak across into our next slide, which kind of gives a graphical view of how that works. Um, so the graphical um, uh, on the top is an instance of an individual. This one was about a two kilowatt system. Um, this is in uh, autumn, in March. So this is just an individual small system for an apartment complex. And this shows you, the green line shows you how much solar was delivered at, delivered at any one time. And then the, um, it should be a navy line, but the navy line covers the, um, the actual energy usage of the apartment. So as you can see, during the very start of the morning, um, there's no one's home, you still got your fridge running. Uh, so a tiny little bit of load, which it's the solar's covering, but then the rest is being fed back to the grid because there's no requirement for that energy from that apartment. Then you come, by the looks of about one o'clock, they come home, turn on a few appliances, uh, maybe do some cooking if they had an um, induction cooktop. Um, you know, turn the TV on, uh, hair dryer, whatever. Um, because the solar isn't big enough, it's not sized high enough to meet that demand, you'll have that portion where the solar can't meet all of your demand. And then towards the end of the day, because it is a small system, it can't cover much of your energy loads um, during the evenings or, or mornings as well. We then have, that's where the solar share comes into its own. So it has, um, Throughout the morning, you still have, there was still a little bit of excess energy, so you still feed a little back, bit back into the grid of that tenancy's allocation. But the cool part is, is where at that one o'clock peak, we've now been able to access 4.5 kilowatts of solar as an individual tenancy. Now, if you average out the amount of panels that are allocated to one individual, it was about 1.8 kilowatts in this instance. But at any one time, they can access a third of that overall system that they're connected to. And in this instance, it only ended up being 4.5. So that could be as high as seven kilowatts in some cases. And that's where the, I guess the beauty of the solar share really comes into its own because everyone's pulling from the same system. Um, there's not as much wastage back to the grid, uh, which means rather than selling energy at five cents per kilowatt hour back to the grid, you're offsetting the need to buy energy at 20 to 40 cents per kilowatt hour, depending on what state you reside in. Um, I'm personally used to live in Adelaide and energy for me was around the 35 cent mark. Um, we're very lucky depending on the state. Melbourne's quite good, usually around 22 cents. New South Wales is a little bit higher, um, but it does vary. And as you know, energy prices do increase, it's very important to you know, use this energy on site um, because the whole feedback into the grid for a financial gain, um, unfortunately, is looking to lower and lower as the future goes on. So. Before we take on batteries as a uh, key aspect, 
how do we make best use of um, the assets that we do have currently? Um, and also remember any questions, um, love answering questions. So once we um, I go through everything, feel free to um, pop them through. All right. There we go, cool. Um, so the biggest thing is how is it beneficial uh, for the customers as a CHP, uh, for your customers or residents? Um, so there's that shared environmental impact. So everyone in the tenant gets to be a part of uh, making a positive environmental impact rather than using fossil fuels um, or traditional energy uh, sourcing methods. On average, generally there's a two tonne savings per year of um, carbon dioxide emissions, um, which is an incredible um, figure um, and one that we like to talk about quite a lot, um, especially towards the whole net zero um, uh, aim. Also, the big thing though is that better financial outcome for, for your residents. Um, traditionally, you know, those in standalone homes, you know, get a large saving, whether it's 30, 40% um, reduction on their electricity bills. It's no different within an apartment, if not a little bit better. Um, keeping in mind that you only, you need a lot less solar, um, which makes it very applicable for apartments um, where there's limited roof space. Um, so on average, I mean, a typical 1.5 kilowatt allocation would see between the $300 and $400 mark probably in savings per year. Um, all of this though depends on your energy usage. So it depends on the site, how new it is, how good the energy efficiency of the appliance are, appliances are within, whether there's heating, whether there's cooling, um, and that does vary state to state, policy to policy, um, as to whether social housing does have those kind of assets within big thing is there's a common benefit for all. So um, whether that's for the tenant or the CHP, um, there's positive impacts um, on all sides. The key thing as well is at the end of the day, um, as an organisation, it needs to be a benefit to you as well. So not only is it a benefit to the tenants, but there's a benefit to CHPs. So as there's been a massive shift from just an ESD focus where it's, you know, renewable, offsite, renewable, solar farms, et cetera, um, there's that transition to ESG, so that environmental and social government aspects. So obviously uh, with solar share projects, um, you have your renewable energy aspect that's ticked off. Um, with the social aspect, you get equitable access um, to tenants in apartments. So instead of just limiting solar to those that live in standalone homes within your portfolio, um, the members um, within under your that reside in the housing assets and apartments now also get that opportunity to experience the benefits of solar. A lot of the time, these are smaller families, um, you know, higher at risk of the stresses of cost of living, for example. Um, so it's really, really important to um, make the most of this. And then it's that ethical renewables procurement. CHPs traditionally uh, have been incredible in this in this space, um, and we see a lot of CHPs setting setting this um, really high level um, within the market. Um, and it's always good because I'm always chatting with developers on a day to day, um, and we just show how CHPs set that standard, um, as a few of our partners have um, in this space. Um, and it's also a bit of a best practice use of assets. So the technology is there; it is viable. Um, it's been proven in the market. So it's how do we do the best thing by both the tenancy, value of the tenancy, because it does become an increased value asset. Um, but the idea is these tenants, you know, lower cost of living through, um, uh, through the savings of um, solar energy, uh, which means they're um, less susceptible to energy increases within the future. And the idea is happier tenants, higher oc occupancy rates as well. Now that's obviously not just sole share specific, that's just a general asset thing, um, but we like to add that in there as well as a consideration just to remind everyone. Um, but the key thing is if you do want to, I guess, extend solar to your entire portfolio, it is very quite difficult to do that um, without solar shares being involved in some regard. Um, and we're there to kind of help that, help that process um, and help review and work with all the industry partners, work with solar installers, um, who are the people that install um, to make that possible. Key positive as well, you get that common area connection as well. So if you have a common area light and power or an existing system, you can even roll that into a solar share install. Um, so, you know, offset those needs. Um, a lot of the time those um, bills aren't very high, especially with LED lighting, um, as we make energy or buildings more efficient, um, that decreases, which is excellent. 
um, but nonetheless, it um, makes it possible. And it's great for those inefficient older buildings um, that would love some uh, more energy efficiency, um, I guess, ratings, higher ratings. And we've got a small quote here um, from Housing Choices Australia as well, um, with a key thing that being um, the tenants didn't really need to worry um, about excessive energy bills as much anymore, especially in winter and summer. Um, so they were very grateful for the benefits of solar um, and this, basically the financial savings um, that they'd get each month as well. I mean, personally, um, my, my mother, for example, used to work with the Salvation Army. And that key thing was when that energy came bill on that three month, that bill came through on that three monthly basis, as it traditionally did. That was when um, people would pop in for assistance because, you know, when you're living week to week, energy bills do have a massive impact on tenants. Um, you know, sometimes it became, you know, do we eat this week? Um, and yeah, it's just a really major thing to be considerate of. Um, this is one of our housing choices one. This has been in for over two years now. Um, for, on average, the tenancies received about 1.5 kilowatts of solar per tenancy. So we had 44 apartments, three soul share modules, um, and yeah, just over $700 of savings um, within that uh, two year period. And that was only with a 25% reduction in uh, consumption from the grid. So we had a lot of people that weren't home during the day or had very minimal um, drawage during the day. But at the end of the day, the biggest thing was that CO2 saving as well from an environmental impact perspective. Um, this was huge. Um, that's with housing choices. And then we've got another one as well um, that we completed with Evolve, um, as well as Energis as the installer, installer partner for this one. So this is a little bit smaller. So we had a couple of small buildings together. They had one shared meter board. Um, so we had 17, 17 apartments overall. And we had about one point, what was it? Two, no, 1.8 roughly kilowatts of solar per tenancy. Um, and this was amazing, this one. We had $437 savings per tenancy um, in the first year. Um, or that was actually just under a year's period and 27% reduction in um, in energy uh, from the grid, which was excellent. Um, but at the end of the day, the key question is, you know, if you have um, multi-resident uh, assets within your uh, portfolio, kind of what is suitable uh, for sole share? And how do you roll out renewables to 100% of your assets if, if that is a, you know, internal um, objective of your organisation? Um, so it's very uh, varied, anything with a shared meter board really, but this is, a um, bit of the um, space that we work in. So community housing, could be boarding homes, um, SDA accommodation. Um, it's great when they're three phase or single phase. Um, the three phase have a bit more power drawage. That's perfectly fine. Um, you can have your partially owned buildings as well, partially strata. So we work quite well in that space. And we can assist um, in the whole um, owners corporation world, the body corporate. Um, we also have affordable housing, um, whether you have your traditional build to rent or your standard affordable housing, either or, and public housing as well. So a bit of my experience before I joined Loom was uh, project managing some uh, public housing, uh, state government assets where sole share was being rolled out on. Um, and just the impact there was, was massive and basically why I got into working with Loom. Um, as far as the site suitability checklist, and um, I'll be able to share these slides as well with everyone. So. Um, you'll have a copy as well. Um, basically anything that's multi-tenancy, so that six to 100 units is, is the ideal. It's really just usable roof space that's the limitation. Um, it is usually a massive surprise. Um, you really don't need that much roof space because you have that sharing capability. You know, it's like having a neighbourhood, you know, 15 individual houses on a standard street. If everyone shared all the panels, you'd get a pretty good benefit. So in an apartment, it's kind of similar but it's all in one place, which is excellent. So it's cost effective. Um, whether your grid meters, I mean, even if you're on an embedded network, because we're all behind the meter, um, it's, it's all a standard. So, um, you know, whether it's grid meters, embedded network meters still works. Usually they'll be co-located on the ground floor um, or in the basement or in a little room next to the building sometimes as well. Um, sometimes there'll be a few buildings um, on a site. And obviously you've got your common area connection that you can roll in as well for those common savings. As long as you have a shared roof space, it's all good to go. Do you work with quite a lot of um, manu um, inverter manufacturers as well. So 
Um, the inverters that can be used by solar installers, you know, you've got your standard Fronius or your main brands, um, and we've just cut brought on end phase as well for those micro inverters um, that can connect up to SolShare as well, which has been um, an exciting time. So even some of the townhouses, as long as it's one uh, shared title, uh, they're all fine there. Now, I won't go into this in too much detail, but um, we generally take a couple of different approaches when we um, sit down with the assets team uh, within a, with the CHP. So it might be a portfolio portfolio approach, might do a bit of an education session with some of the um, housing assets team. Basically, what is sole share? How does it work? What are the impacts um, to, to tenants and to uh, the business as well, or the organisation being a non-profit? You know, what is the best way forward? Is it a pilot project? Is it a couple of projects? Usually like to suggest, you know, take on one project, get experience with how the process works. Um, and then we assist with obtaining quotes from solar installers um, who are the, at the end of the day, the ones that install the systems. So we, um, although we're involved in the process, we can consult a little bit in that aspect as well um, to be of assistance. Um, so yeah, the whole tendering procurement. Um, or sometimes we might have a CHP that goes, we've got a new build that we'd love to roll sole share onto. Um, and then we'll sit down with the development team, the consulting engineers, the architects, all those parties, just to make sure that all the considerations are made uh, to make sure SolShare can fit within that. Um, SolShare doesn't need much roof space and the SolShare module doesn't take up much room. Usually there's no issues, uh, but it's good to be part of that and make sure all your electrical drawings um, do consider SolShare as well. Um, it's basically a common area only system plus a box um, that allows you to connect to the apartments. So it works out very well. Um, but yeah, always, it's always good to just give us a call, have a chat, um, and that's the best way of going about it. Uh, so that covers my uh, aspect of the presentation. Um, this is one of our installs here, Got a couple of inverters with two soul shares. Um, my details are there, so feel free, give me a call. Um, you can reach out to our website. Got a, quite a few case studies on there as well uh, for a few other uh, states as well. Um, one that has Ryan's, one of Ryan's sites that he'll be speaking about later, no doubt. Um, but yeah, so that covers it. I'll hand back to you, Sarah, um, I guess, to handle the questions. If there are any questions for anyone, please feel free, um, feel free to fire away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Will. That was a really fantastic overview of the Soul Share, and I'm really impressed to see those savings that the uh, tenants were experiencing um, I think you mentioned yeah three hundred dollars to four hundred and fifty dollars per year which is a really significant amount for someone on a low income um, and yeah those case studies um, those savings were really really amazing so thank you so much um, I think we do have a question here um, so um, the question is you mentioned retrofitting the existing social housing for energy efficiency what are the ways we can do that and is it viable to do them yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm assuming it's just in the aspect of solar, for example, um, to cover to cover what we do a lot of the time, um, a when it becomes to like energy efficiency as a kind of light item of, of an asset, they go, well, what can we do that's easy? Usually LED lighting upgrades are the first avenue um, of implementation because the savings from that are quite massive. Um, then you go into, you know, um, where you can extra insulation um, to reduce that energy energy need. Um, and then that's combined with shared solar uh, for those retrofits as well. So at least then, you know, you can only do so much on an energy um, efficiency standpoint, and then it's offsetting any of that energy requirements by having on site um, renewable or energy um, production through the sole share or, or general solar. Um, we do quite a lot of um, some of our public housing work um, in SA, for example, uh, that was all retrofits. They did a few refurbs um, um, in, in their asset class. So it was those three story walk up um, buildings, uh, installed soul share. In that aspect, we did install batteries as well, um, which is quite, a, quite an exciting space. Not, not that we see batteries very often because of the way the soul share works kind of offsets the need um, at this stage, although in the future, as they get cheaper, it will make more sense. Um, but for now, it just hasn't been very common. Um, but still, yeah, absolutely. So we'd probably say 50-50 of our buildings um, that we uh, work with are retrofits and the other 50 are new builds. Um, of those um, in the 
ten tendency of social housing to non-social housing. Probably about two thirds of our installs are social housing. The other third is um, a lot of it's high um, luxury apartments as well, or your standard OC, um, because Soul Share is very unique in what it does. Um, it's it's an excellent way of actually allocating solar to apartments. Um, so it just shows that in social housing it has a big impact. So tons of um, retrofits that we have. Um, most of the case studies on the website are retrofits. So check them out. They've all got at least 12 months of data on there. Um, and you can see any questions, feel free to let me know though. Um, we always, we're very experienced with coming across different oddities in retrofit projects, you know, locations of switchboards, old switchboards, um, all of those kind of things, rise of space, which is a key thing as well. Hope that answers your question, Sunil. Um, and yeah, yes, yeah, so it'll be both of those. Thanks, Will. And yeah, it's really fantastic to um, hear that the soul share is usable for both uh, new and existing housing assets because um, I know that's um, obviously there's a lot of existing social housing. So that's um, really helpful for people to know. Um, yeah, and there's um, Luke, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Um, this is great. Um, just a question like going back to your slide, um, <clears throat> comparing with and without soul share. Um, I don't quite understand how um, you like to. The yellow line seems to go above the generation. Um, so, is that just based on the fact that different units will use energy at different times, um, and so on? So, I just like a better understanding on um, on how you actually get to match um, generation with demand when it looks like the generation is higher than what you've actually got. If that makes sense. Yeah, ab absolutely. Like, so, um, let me just pop back to that slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can see that one. Yeah. So um, the biggest thing is because this is on um, the key thing I forgot to mention, probably this is an individual apartment. So and on a day to day, it'll vary. So a standard solar curve does look like that green line. So because we're using a bigger system, if we had an overall system graphical view of say the overall site demand and overall site consumption, the sole share production would be would look like that. But when you split it down on a per apartment basis, each apartment's graphical will look like this. But if you combined all 15 apartments, we get that nice overall solar curve. So the idea is because at this point in time, you've got 4.5 kilowatts of energy being allocated to you, that means um, elsewhere within the complex, they'd be in a period where someone's not home, for example, or they're not utilizing energy. You know, if you turn your kettle on, it, you know, it might be a, a minute or two that it's on or a couple of minutes. Um, we find that it's it's very similar to, you know, not everyone goes to the supermarket at say 10 a.m. in the morning. It is spread out throughout the day. You have a couple of people constantly going in, going out, going in, going out. And that's where the the real beauty of it lies. Um, that's it's it seems to, it works really well in, you know, everyone has a different demand at different times. Um, and at the end of the day, if everyone had the same demand all the time throughout the day, it would just equally distribute anyway. So there's still that benefit. Um, and I will touch on as well, Luke, we, in a traditional setting, well, any setting, for example, if you, um, COVID's helped with this, but if you work from home during the work week, for example, or just say Monday, Tuesday, um, you're working from home. So during those days, you'll have a higher requirement for solar than say Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, when you're from the office. So then the solar share learns through its algorithm, it goes, well, during those days that you're not home or periods of time throughout the day that you're not home, we won't allocate you your portion of energy. We'll wait till you, know, you have that need and you're home before we allocate you that portion. So when you are home, that's what unlocks that higher allocation as well for that 4.5. Um, we work to the month to month basis, just so seasons don't get in the way. Um, but yeah, at, at the end of the day, everyone gets an equal amount. So if you weren't home, for example, for the entire month, obviously all your energy would be fed back to the grid if you didn't have any um, energy usage, um, but that's identical to a standalone system would anyway. Um, but the real benefit comes when you're, you know, obviously using energy. Yeah. That makes sense. And and just a question around future um, plans around two-way markets and distributed um, demand response and EVs. 
yeah, um, will you guys be playing in that space? At this at the moment, because we're um, you know we don't need to be connected to the internet. It's all behind the meter. Um, we don't need to buy and sell energy uh, because it's distributing straight to each um, tenancy just behind the meter, just behind the meter. Um, it may be it may get to the point where we do, but at the moment it's we don't find it necessary um, for EVs, for example. Usually, sometimes you might have a small EV charger on each apartment. At least then you get to use some of your your allocation as an apartment complex for your EV. That works fine. Um, and then that demand response, you know, the soul shed does work as a, it's, I guess it's a roundabout way of, it is demand response on a, an apartment building because you're offsetting that, where is that maximum need at any one time, keeping in mind that um, you still have to share it out. So from say a DNSP, local DNSP, you know, whether it's um, what's in Queensland, um, Energy Queensland, whatever, they love um, products like ours, for example, because it just means there's less stress on the grid because you have one, you have, you know, up to a hundred people sharing one system. So you're not feeding back into the grid unnecessarily and contributing to grid instability. Um, and one day, you know, it'd be great to get one battery for every soul share, um, which can happen, but we just, we haven't seen the need for it yet. Um, but yeah, on a demand on that, all of that, we may see that come in more um, and it is starting to happen, but we kind of sit separate the benefits there and we just you know we'll wait and see how that changes thanks no worries, thanks so much will so i'm just going to share my screen now so i'd just like to welcome jane west who is the chief executive officer at brick housing um and jane i will just go to your first slide now there for you great thanks can everyone hear me yes we can great perfect we're, 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 we're doing well. I did get thrown out of the meeting earlier, but I'm back on, so <laughs> relieved. Um, so thanks, um, Will, for that presentation. And I'm just going to speak um, from a very non-technical um, um, side of um, our, our partnership with um, Alum Energy that we're, we're very excited about. So, um, and I also just wanted to um, give a shout out to the QCOS Energy team who um, do amazing work. And, and in fact, it was a tip off from them that have allowed to get this, us to get this project off the ground. Um, so first of all, just a, a brief, um, I guess, um, uh, statement around the fact that we our tenants really should be the ones that are getting the most benefit out of these new technologies and it feels like they're the ones that are getting the least benefit whether it's energy or or transport evs the digital divide um you know it, it, it there's a there's there's a danger that our tenants are going to get left behind and and more excluded um so we're very passionate um at brick about um doing doing our bit to address that it's not easy in queensland um in in terms of getting funding um, for energy efficiency um, initiatives um, and in fact um, you know we we have searched and we're always scouring the internet for grants and um, you know any any kind of funding that we can get um, towards this um, one of the issues with community housing in Queensland is that a lot of our buildings are leased, um, many of them leased from the Department of Housing, so it creates an issue about how we, we get that long term investment into the properties um, and, and also just the pace of, I guess, changing technologies and what we put in now. I think we see buildings that were had the latest technology from five and 10 years ago and, and it's already outdated. So, um, you know, all, all challenges that we face. Um, just a quick mention of a solar system that we put into a unit complex, a studio unit complex um, a couple of years ago. There's a picture of it there on the first slide at the top. Um, so it, it's actually a building, it's an ex-motel and it's a building with a single electricity supply. So it was a relatively straightforward ex exercise um, to put um, solar panels on, on the roof. Um, we actually installed aircon in all the units as well because there's no cross ventilation. They were very hot um, and we couldn't provide that thermal comfort without them. Um, we have... Um, even with the aircon installed, the electricity costs at that building have come down by a third. So they were $16 a week for our tenants, um, and they're now um, sitting around $9.50 $9 a week. So um, definitely a benefit there from, um, from a solar installation. 
So if we just um, go to the next slide, if that's okay, Sarah. Um, so as Will said, um, one of the ways of um, putting, putting soil share in is to do it in a new build development. And that is what we have been um, very fortunate to be in a position to do. Um, so we've got an 18 unit development at Redcliffe, um, one bedroom units funded through um, a social housing. Um, the units are designed to capture breezes, they're well ventilated um, and, and as, you know, as thermally comfortable as we can make them. Um, but uh, as I say, as a result of a tip off from QCOS, we heard about the Climate Smart Action Grant Program. Um, so we put in an application partnering with, um, with Illum and with QCOS um, to install a a solar system there, I think it's 34 kilowatts, Will will correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, and with two sole share units, um, and that building is, um, it's actually just starting construction now. So the way that's working just in terms of um, our, you know, the relationships, I guess, and who's doing what. Um, so that's actually now been incorporated in the construction contract. Um, the solar installers and solar share are all being coordinated by the builder um, in, to, to make sure that the, um, the install is all um, uh, integrated and um, goes smoothly. Just in terms of the timing on that, um, we are we're thinking that that building will be will have the roof ready to put the system on it about um, hopefully by this time next year, um, and that the tenant the units will be ready to move in by the end of the year. So the grant is covering 80% of that cost. Brick is covering 20% of the cost. And obviously we have the um, ongoing responsibility for, for maintenance and, and ultimately replacement of the system as well. Um, I think we didn't catch all your presentation, Will, but um, one of the great benefits of the system is that tenants will have access to an online energy use portal. Um, so we, you know, give, gives them control over their and understanding over their energy use. And um, we'll be working with um, QCOS to uh, evaluate the benefits at, when the system's up and running, um, to evaluate the benefits and to, um, I guess, to get, get, get the word out. Um, we would love to do more in this space. Um, we're going to look at different options. We may, we may be looking at power purchase agreements as well. Um, but um, the, the, you know, the ultimate um, prize is to get it, get the system funded up front so that um, all the benefits of the solar energy generated go, go to the tenants. Um, so yeah, I'm, um, I've whizzed through because I think we're up against it for time, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, that's such an exciting project and we're really excited to see um, the outcomes and the benefits on the tenants. Um, and like I mentioned at the start, um, this will be the first time um, in Queensland where a, a social housing unit block um, will have solar that is um, shared between all the tenants. So it is very exciting. Um, and I know this is a space that probably a lot of people online uh, are currently looking into. Um, so feel free to um, unmute yourself if you have any questions for Jane. Um, but I also just wanted to mention um, that Climate Smart Action Grant that Jane spoke about. Um, it's definitely a good thing for um, everyone online and for community organisations in general to look into. Um, and like we also mentioned with the, the new Queensland Energy and Jobs Plan, there will hopefully be more opportunity for community organisations to get funding to install things like solar um, onto their building or onto uh, social housing complexes as well. Um, so does anyone have any um, questions for Jane? Okay, I don't think I can see anyone with their hand up. Um, and Will's just mentioned a comment in the chat um, about the full energy usage information and solar generation allocated to their tenancy. Was that with regards to the um, online energy use portal, Will? Yeah, yeah. So as an individual uh, tenant, you can see your own energy usage, um, the solar allocated to you as well. 
Um, so it really encourages uh, tenants to get best use of their energy. Um, and Rome might cover it a little bit. Um, City West are amazing in this space, uh, but you know it's basically putting it on the tenant to go. You know, if you want to save more, you know, you might change your energy habits a little bit. Um, and it's really empowering in that aspect. From an asset portfolio manager point of view, we also have a portal um, that meets that requirement as well. So you can look at all your assets within your portfolio from one place. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it at that from my end. Awesome. That's fantastic. Thanks, Will. And thank you so much, Jane, for that um, wonderful overview of the um, exciting project. And we're looking thank forward you. to um, seeing how that all goes. So I'd just Thanks. like to welcome Ryan Rosenbaum, who is the head of assets from City West Housing. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, and I'll um I'll just share my screen. Um, hopefully it comes up. Maybe it'll rumble. Okay, I think that's worked. Yes, thanks, Ryan. Fantastic. So my name is Ryan Rosenbaum. I'm head of assets and, and looking after this space, I guess, for, for our organisation here at City West Housing. So just a bit of a, an overview about our company. So um, City West Housing has been operating roughly since uh, 1994, where it was established to provide affordable housing within the city of Sydney. So so we currently operate uh, mainly, mainly medium density uh, buildings across the city with about 21 um, medium rise buildings, anywhere between sort of two to three levels all the way up to, to seven or eight levels with about 933 units across that, um, across that portfolio. Um, so we're not really um, tackling, I guess, the housing market or the housings itself. It's, it's more around the, the residential unit complexes. And that's why this particular system and project uh, that we've worked through was, was quite important. So for us, there was a bit of a decision-making process and it encapsulates quite a diverse um, area, um, particularly in the sustainability sphere. So we looked at, um, I guess, setting the initial upfront um, policy um, and implementation plan um, right, up the, right up the front of this particular project or, or in, might I add in particular, the, the whole project that we've done in the sustainability side of things. So we really looked at areas around our new construction, our existing offices, um, and we really delved into things like energy, water and recycling as well. So that forms part of our overall strategic plan um, that looks at the sustainability approach across our organisation. The next portion of it, and I'll sort of go into it in our next sort of slide as to where we're up to with this plan, um, was around the implementation of those key components as well. So to be able to convince the board about the overall spending um, in relation to what we're doing, we really needed to have that strategic approach up front. And then we really needed to have that um, implementation plan um, straight in there as well. And that it really included the engagement of consultants, um, the survey and collection of data from our residents, um, and also most importantly, the funding. And I'll talk about some of the uh, nitty gritty about the, the actual connections and the costs and everything as we proceed through. Um, and also around the, the product and the selection of products that we have, because there's, as we all know, there's, there's so many products on the market when it comes to solar panels itself. Um, and then the last point that we really wanted to touch on was around the data collection, the reporting, and then also reviewing the whole project um, itself. And the project's not just the, the residential solar component of it, um, it also encapsulates things like the water recycling, um, travel and transport as well. So where we're currently up to, um, and as part of that decision-making process, initially we started off with the, the common area lighting. So we retrofitted um, and I might add, these are all retrofits. It's not part of our new development. Um, and our new developments are sort of coming into play um, currently as we speak um, into the next couple of years. So as sort of Will mentioned, the easy winds are around lighting sometimes. So we retrofitted about 1500 lights across our portfolio. Um, and, the, and the spend on that project was about 
um, or just over $400,000, but it has an annual power saving of about $139,000. So, so our overall annual power bill across our 21 buildings was just over $235,000 uh, per year, and we've saved a good chunk of that just on the lighting. Uh, the waste and recycling, as I sort of mentioned, as part of that strategic approach, we really looked at uh, bringing in those educational programs, including easy signage, um, and we started to reduce about 4.3 tonnes of general waste um, into our landfills each year, and we're now recycling that annually. Um, and then the project that we're going to really delve into today was that stage one solar project, uh, which was around retrofitting about 225 residential units over three buildings um, to the sole share or a loom system. Um, and producing those annual savings, which we'll start to look at as we proceed through it. So our overall strategic approach was really looking at those different stages, and we're currently um, just finalised the tender for stage two solar, um, and we're also starting to work on that thermal comfort side of things, um, which we're seeing is going to be quite important, and um, everyone in Queensland there would, would see that as a quite important area as well. So I found it, I always found it important to sort of get down into the dollar figures as well. So this is really delving into, you know, the costs associated with such projects that we, we have. So for us, we had um, sites one through to, to three, um, and these particular projects were the sole share um, included, you know, that PV technology, but connecting those 225 units across that portfolio. So as you can see there, you can see the, the size of the system, the number of apartments, um, and some of them are quite large apartments. Um, you can see the costs associated with um, those particular projects. Um, and then you can also see the energy bill savings, which uh, are now a direct benefit for, for our residents moving forward. Um, and then the last column, you start to look at things like the per cost of kilowatt for, for install as well. And that's quite important for those asset managers or, or people looking for sort of funding moving forward, um, because you can see quite the, quite the difference between uh, the per kilowatt cost on, on residential units um, when we're doing the retrofit um, compared to sort of the common areas where it's just a, a straight single connection. Um, and I guess the reason for that is that there's quite a lot of wiring uh, particularly with those retrofits that we are doing. Um, and that was predominantly the costs um, associated with that per kilowatt side of things. So if you are looking at new developments, um, then that per kilowatt would definitely come down considerably because it's, um, you know, wiring at the time of, of that particular site. The other thing that sort of come into play for us um, was the funding aspect. And I'll quickly touch on a, a couple of different funding avenues that we went through. So uh, one of them was through um, um, DPIE, which is, which is in our particular um, area here in New South Wales. So, uh, so that's the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. Um, and they assisted with funding as part of the Home Energy Action Program. Uh, but more importantly, what's on offer from the federal government is those um, small scale um, technology certificates, the STCs. Um, and this particular project um, benefited um, about $160,000 just on those STC claim back from the, from the federal government. So if you are looking for, I guess, funding streams, that federal approach is, is definitely there in relation to it. So some of the things we, saw, we started to look at as we went into the project as well is the contractual requirements. So sole share is just one portion um, of, the, of the overall project. Um, and that sort of comes in in the last little, little bit there, but it was also identifying the correct contractors for, for the particular projects. And, and Will and the team from, from Illum can help you with identifying those particular contracts. Otherwise you can, um, Otherwise, it sort of comes a bit more complicated when it comes to connecting it. So you can go out to an open market in relation to, to the contractors. Um, those site visits and actually developing the, you know, the contract documentation was um, very crucial to this project as well. And as you can sort of see at the bottom there, we really started to look at things like 
um, panel performance over the, the 25 year lifespan, uh, we started looking at the degradation of those particular panels as well. And the ones we eventually landed on are sort of in what we call the, the tier one market, um, just bordering on sort of tier two. So it's not your higher end panels like your LGs um, and that sort of thing, which are quite expensive. It sort of just sits a little bit under that. It provides us really great performance, which is really important. Um, and again, the inverters for us were quite important quite a critical component of it as well. Um, so we had that, you know, no costs um, in relation to the two years and then supported by the online monitoring platform for those particular inverters. And we found that quite important because we can actually confirm the data between sort of that inverter and also the sole share um, details that we've got as well. Um, and I guess the end of that is around, you know, the contractual requirements around the sole share technology as well. And that's something that the Illum team can really help you um, get into your contracts when you're sort of moving through that particular area. So why sole share for us? Um, so we operate, as we sort of mentioned, in that medium density um, building sphere. Um, so it was quite hard to find um, any technology out there that would be um, suitable for the needs that we have until we sort of come across the soul share stuff. So, um, so why is it important? It still gives our residents autonomy, um, being that the, the connections behind the meter, as Will mentioned, um, we can actually distribute different, different um, kilowatts depending on different bedroom sizes. So we can allocate more um, depending on, you know, whether it's a one, two or three bedroom. Um, it's demand driven, and I'll show you that as we sort of move through with some of the live um, data that we're starting to collect. Um, and again, more importantly, there's no locking contracts with their energy retailers as well. So people are still free to, to go out there and sign up um, and get the best deal that they want, which is really important. In the residential, I guess, sphere, um, when it looks at the engagement side of things. So initially we developed that uh, communication strategy right up front. And that's been uh, quite crucial because we did really need to collect a lot of um, information and data from the residents, including, including their existing energy bills. Uh, we had some data consent forms that they needed to, to get to. Um, but more importantly, we looked at surveys as well. And the survey was quite critical in relation to measuring the outcomes um, at a later date. Um, and that's really going to inform how this project uh, really went. During the project itself, we, we spent a lot of time on that communications front, whether it's letters or SMSs, posters, um, educational materials about how this will benefit the particular resident, because everyone's sort of was a bit skeptical about uh, whether we're locking them in a contract, whether City West Housing was now their retailer. So there was a few sort of things that we needed to, to go through in relation to that and really close the door on that communication front, which is really important. Um, and again, it's the end of uh, the project as well, looking at those post installation surveys, um, the data analytics that we're now collecting through the um, through the, the soul share portal, which is uh, which is quite important, um, and that re educational space, which we'll sort of talk about um, in my next slide, I think it is. So as sort of William William mentioned, he, he showed you a bit of a graph, and these are actual graphs. Um, from our, from some of our particular residents. So as you can sort of see here, household one, um, the green line, as you can see, is their energy demand across the day. Um, and the yellow line where it just sort of peaks and everything like that, that's the actual sole share unit uh, working to our side of things. So you can see, as William sort of mentioned, that time of use is really important and, and it's really starting to, to match the actual usage from those particular residents. Um, so household one, and I'd say kind of household two or our, our sort of um, best, best case scenarios where they're starting to use the solar um, throughout the day. Um, but less, but more importantly, household three is, is one that, um, we really started to target as part of our educational program. So we can see of the late afternoon around eight o'clock, there was a, a massive spike in, in their electricity usage. Um, 
And after having a, a, a talk to this particular tenant, they actually got home from, from work for the day, um, threw their clothes in the washing machine and, and done the washing at that particular time. So what we're able to do is we're able to have a chat to that particular resident. We're able to say, well, if you brought your usage forward, you know, before four o'clock, you know, between two or three, or even moved it off to a weekend, um, you'll be actually using the, the solar system um, in the background instead of actually paying for that particular usage. So, um, so there's three really good examples where you can sort of see those households um, are using that sort of energy throughout the day. Um, and that sole share unit is actually maximizing or, or cross-benefiting from, from what it does. So what I've also got is, um, is a little video that uh, Sarah wanted me to show, which is, I guess, a bit of a wrap up um, of our whole project, um, in particular, our carriage works, which is sort of sitting at the, the tail end. Um, so hopefully the sound works, maybe shout out if it doesn't. Um, so when I first heard that the solar was coming in, I was really excited. Um, I had spoken to City West Housing a couple of times about the potential of solar coming into um, my building and also other buildings. And we live in such a sunny spot that I thought solar would be a really great opportunity for the residents to reduce their power bills or even just reduce the you know, carbon footprint of the common areas even. At City West Housing, we offer affordable homes to 1,600 residents in 20 buildings, filling a significant and growing market gap for people renting on very low through to moderate incomes. We understand how fundamental a secure, stable home is for people's health and well-being, and we recognise the importance of energy efficiency in helping us achieve that. We are installing photovoltaic solar, otherwise known as PV, across several buildings in our portfolio. We're confident these installations will significantly help our residents by lowering the cost of energy bills, therefore freeing up income for other things. The added benefit to the environment that solar PV brings is also a big plus for us. I think having solar will make a great difference to um, my building. I think there will be a reduction in some of my um, power bills. I think it's also a great peace of mind and showing that other apartment buildings across the city of Sydney can look into solar for themselves. The rooftop solar couldn't have come at a better time. I recently retired and I've already found a huge difference in my power bill. I was actually a bit excited for opening up my new electricity bill just to see if there was savings. That was something that was going to be predicted that would happen. So it looks like I've saved about 50% on my electricity bill so far. As I'm now retired and uh, in my own personal lockdown, I used my TV an awful lot, pretty well 24-7 watching a lot of films and documentaries. I know that my TV uses up a lot of electricity. So with the solar, that makes that less of a worry. Um, I don't have to be counting every cent because the solar is doing that for me. In the time I've been here, my electricity bills were going up and going up and going up. And now they seem to have stabilised and maybe dropped a little bit. At the end of the day, it's all about saving power and using as many of my appliances during the day as I can. Part of this solar, I've changed my electricity habits and so I've been using more things um, during the day such as doing my washing during the day, um, baking during the day and just charging um, laptops, phones and other appliances during the day. So I know that upstairs is working hard for me and I can save more money. We believe installing solar PV is one of the best ways we can support our residents financially and we're really pleased to go ahead with these upgrades. If you're also thinking about installing solar, I encourage you to take the plunge. Talk to other housing providers who have installed energy efficiency upgrades for their residents and reach out to your local supplier to get started. Solar has made my life and my neighbours' lives better, easier and greener. This has been a great initiative by City West Housing. Thank you so much, Ryan, for that um, presentation. And it was really great to hear your whole journey um, with installing solar, but also to hear about those other programs that you put into place, um, you know, helping residents learn about recycling. Um, and of course, the, 
um, installation of the lights as well and how much money that saved you. So it was really great to hear all those different aspects. Um, and thank you also for the tip about the small scale technology certificates, because I'm sure that's something that people will be going away and researching. So that's um, really great to hear. Uh, we do have a question for you here. Um, so it's from Sunil. So um, Ryan, you mentioned wiring was the major chunk of the expenditure while retrofitting. Do you think it would be a good idea to install them in new buildings, even if whole solar system is not feasible owing to maybe enough funds, etc.? I'm sure as much as the cost of the wires, it's also the difficulty of installing them in, a, in an existing setup. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. And, um, and I say that it was a chunk of wiring because uh, some of the buildings that we actually did um, have the, the meters on individual levels uh, within the complex. So it meant that we were installing the solar panels on the roof, the inverters on the roof, and also the, the solar or the soul share device as well. And we're having to wire down to those particular meters and then back up to the roof. So um, we went through um, quite a lot of cabling just to be able to do that. But why I say that retrofitting, um, it, it still does stack up for, for our case. So we were distributing anywhere between sort of 1.2 to 1.7 kilowatts um, per unit, which is, which is really good. And that's still under that $2,000 per kilowatt, which is sort of our, our aim for any of our projects. But when I say the new developments are, are really good because you can start to co-locate a lot of those meters in, in a particular area. So when you're you know, doing a design for a particular building, you can um, co-locate a lot of those meters, let's just say in the basement. And then it would be sort of one wire from, from the rooftop down to the basement instead of multiple. So um, the reason I say the wiring was quite costly because you know, labor is costly as well when you're looking at you know, licensed electricians and all the rest of it. Just, running wires up and down. Awesome, thanks Thanks for that, Ryan. Um, does anyone have any other questions for Ryan? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions. Okay, looks like you've blown them away, Ryan. <laughs> There's lots, I think, to think about there. Um, could I make a suggestion, um, Sarah? I think, I mean, there's been so much useful material coming out of this um, webinar. I know I've learned a lot. Um, I, I think it would be great if um, QCOS, maybe with QCOS, we could do some advocacy for community housing providers in terms of um, with government around funding and, uh, you know, part, part, you know, there's a lot to learn on the technical side, but, but actually, um, you know, there's a need to put some investment into this as well. So um, yeah. I'd be really interested in taking the conversation forward about how we do that. Yeah, that's a that's a really great suggestion, Jane. Um, yeah, and I think um, especially in Queensland, um, it's probably been an area that's not been explored as much as in other states. So I think, um, yeah, that advocacy would be really important. Um, and obviously it is a really costly thing. Um, for organisations to be installing solar. And so there really does need to be that financial um, incentive and that financial help from the government to, um, yeah, encourage organisations to consider it as well. So, um, yeah, I'll note that down, Jane, um, as, a, as a point. Um, and I also just want to mention uh, that the presentation slides from today's session will be sent out in a PDF format to everyone. So um, you will be able to go through all of that um, at another time to read through. Um, it looks like we don't have any other questions, but I just want to say um, a big thank you to our guest speakers, Jane, Ryan and Will. Thank you so much for your time. I've learned a lot today and I'm sure everyone else online has. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for giving up your time to talk to us today. Um, and I know a lot of people online are probably going to be going away and researching and exploring this. So um, it's really fantastic. Um, and thank you to everyone who's attended today. Um, we are just putting up a poll um, so that we can um, find out how you found the webinar. And also, if you do have any other suggestions on any webinars we can do relating to energy or water, please let us know because this is an area that QCOS uh, does focus on. Um, we run different water webinars and energy webinars throughout the year. So if you ever have any suggestions, please feel free to reach out. 
Um, but otherwise, I will draw the webinar to a close. Thank you again, everyone, for attending. And thank you to our speakers. And I hope you all have a good rest of the day.